giddy up in the world today. <laughs> what a platform. All right. Well, they're closing the doors in the back. I hope that doesn't mean that those are in the back can't come out. <laughs> we need them. Now, here they come. Just give, give folks a second here to get their seats. There they come. There we go. You're having such a good time fellowshipping with one another. I understand it. That's okay. That's a nice time. A nice time. Well, we welcome you all here in the name of the Lord Jesus this morning. Glad to see you out on a beautiful Sunday morning. And before we start our singing, I'd just like each one of us again, as usual, to just ask the Lord's blessing silently before we start. Amen. Okay. Well, I realize this is not Easter Sunday. We have two weeks to go, but we're going to have the praise team for Easter. And uh, Amy has uh, uh, told me they have a nice special program for everybody. So I think you're really going to enjoy the program that Amy and her company put together. But we're going to sing some Easter songs today. I know there's a lot of you folks out there that say, look, I, I, I need my Easter songs. It's kind of like Christmas carols. So we're going to sing some today, and I hope you enjoy them. So if you would please turn to number 220 in your hymnal, please, number 220. It is, he lives, I am the living one, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Revelation 118. Number 220. Sing it out. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how. sounding pretty good. Now, as my daughter, who's a, who's a music ed teacher, and her voices are major, and she's now, Dad, when you sing, don't sing through your throat or your nose. You don't sing through your nose. She says, you sing from your diaphragm. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm not that good at it yet, but I'm trying to push from the diaphragm up. It gives you more volume, and it's less fatiguing when you sing, they say. So I'm learning day by day. All right, let's try. So I want you to do that. You're sounding good. We'll just keep up the good singing. Here we go. Verse 2. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart was weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. A day of his appearing will come. Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know we live. He Eternal hallelujah 
17, please. Number 217. And I got to be careful with our time because I do want to sing a couple songs. So number uh, 217, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4 of number 217. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your doors and fly on high, hallelujah. Sing a hymn and reply. some announcements for us. A good morning to all. Uh, we're happy to have with us as our speaker today our brother Mark Colchin. Uh, he and I share a college uh, reference together, uh, Wheaton College, so uh, it's, we have a little bio here. It doesn't mention that, so I had to mention that up front, I guess. Uh, Mark was commended to full-time work in 1993 from Bethany Bible Chapel in Silverton, New Jersey. Uh, he's a board member for now three organizations, the America Keswick, the Pines at Whiting, and the Senior Living Facility. Uh, he's also the editor of Cornerstone Magazine and founder of Know the Word Ministries. And then it says he's active in hosting various regional conferences and webinars. I would just say he's active because uh, he's doing quite a bit. Uh, so we welcome him in the name of the Lord both this week and next week. Uh, we have our regular announcements through the week. Our Monday 10 a.m. Bible study here at the chapel back in the fellowship room. Tuesday, uh, another Bible study at the Papson House with uh, dinner at 6, followed by the Bible study at 7. Uh, Wednesday, the church prayer time, both on Zoom and um, here in the fellowship room. And then Friday is a Friday Night Kids Club, as well as a junior, senior high uh, youth group at Woodside. Um, coming up in the near future is a Women's Spring Missionary Conference uh, on Saturday, April 20th uh, at uh, Valley Bible Chapel at 9.30 a.m. 
and there's more information, and in uh, I believe on the back bulletin board, it says a sign-up is required. Um, I'd also, um, last week, had read off uh, some information about uh, now being able to contribute electronically. I'm not going to read the whole announcement all over again, but just wanted to men make mention of it again, once again, this week, that uh, you can now contribute through Zelle. For Zelle, you have to go onto your uh, bank account. Not all banks have it. Or you can contribute through PayPal. Uh, then there's information on our chapel website, as well as information on the back bulletin board about contributing that way. Um, for um, prayer requests, our Family of the Week is uh, Mike Leschak, uh, so you want to keep him in prayer. Missionary of the Week, uh, Joel Clark, ministering in Peru. And then um, for the uh, prayer requests, uh, continue member Pat Hubbinger, who's recovering at home. And then uh, two recent ones, uh, Marion Muller, who fell and is currently at Overlook, uh, but she's hoping to be released Tuesday. And then uh, Iva Thompson, uh, I just heard, we just heard this morning, um, has been admitted to uh, Robert Woods Hospital in Rawway uh, with chest pain. So we just want to remember her. And I think we can add, you know, there's a couple people I've heard that are looking for jobs. We can remember them. Uh, any other prayer requests to mention? Wow, okay. Okay, let's go to prayer. Lord of glory, we're just amazed that we can enter your presence. We're amazed that we can come before the God who created everything, the God who keeps everything going, and we can only do that, Lord, because you were also the God who became man, as we'll uh, uh, soon think about. And when it comes to Easter, became man and not only became man, but died for men. Lord, we thank you that you died that we might live. We thank you that you died that our sins would be taken far away. Lord, we just thank you for this now. Holy Lord, we pray for um, Mark as he speaks and uh, pray that he will speak with your, uh, with your spirit and your words, Lord. We pray for all the activities through the week and ask your blessing upon them. And Lord, we think of those that uh, um, here on the prayer list. We pray for um, our brother Mike, as who was just recently lost his wife. And uh, we pray for him. Lord, we pray for Joel Clark in Peru. And Lord, we think of those closer to home. We think of uh, Pat Hubbinger, uh, recovered at home. Think of uh, Marion and uh, Iva in the hospital. Lord, we pray for them as that the you would uh, guide the doctors in their treatment. Uh, we think of those looking for jobs, Lord. Pray that you would help them to find that job. And then we think of this friend of uh, Karen Atlasley who uh, just passed away, leaving a child. Lord, we pray for that situation. Uh, pray, Lord, that uh, I don't know that they um, know you. Lord, we pray that they would certainly uh, be told about you, that have the opportunity to receive you, Lord. But we just pray for that situation also, that you would... Uh, um, bring guidance and comfort to the, that family. Lord, we pray for all these things now in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll sing a couple more songs. Number 213, please. Number 213 in your hymnal. And uh, I believe we can sing all three verses of that. Got to watch our time. I want to make sure I give Mark plenty of time. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lived. Because he lived, I can face tomorrow.
tell you, on the, we're going to sing verse 3. I've got to watch my time here. You'll forgive me. But on verse 3, when we get to the refrain, we're going to just slow it down just a little bit. Just a little, not a lot. You listen to Margaret and Kathy, and you'll know right where we are. Better them than me. <laughs> okay, so verse 3. Here we go. And then one day I'll cross the river I'll find life's fun A war with pain And then the death Gives way to victory I'll see the light of glory And all my Savior live song I'm going to take you just if you'll indulge me for one minute and Diane says oh no he's going to start talking look out (laughs) but but at any rate uh, just a little stroll down memory lane when I was a little boy and I know there's quite a few folks in here that were born and raised here before me but when I was a little boy uh, there was no pews we had a linoleum floor with uh, wooden double seats goes all the way back and where the doors and the bookshelf are back there that was just a slide curtain and it went all the way back to the original building. And on an Easter Sunday, we used to fill up this room with over 400 people. I remember head counts of 410, 411, 412, and uh, some of the uh, more senior folks here can remember that as well. And I can remember as a little boy sitting there, Mr. George Sharp would lead the singing, and I waited for this song every Easter Sunday. I waited for it. And it would be sung. And then as I got a little older, Mr. Robert Hubbinger was up here with his golden voice, which I miss dearly, and he still has it. But uh, a little changing of the guard, he served his time. But I waited for him to sing that song, and I couldn't wait. That was my Easter Sunday. And I've been told by several of you that you need to hear this song. Now, again, as I said, Amy has a wonderful program uh, in store for you on Easter Sunday with the praise team and, and others involved. But we have to sing this song. Now, so it's number 216, and those that are able, I'm going to ask you to stand, and uh, if you can, and we're going to uh, sing Christ the Rose, number 216. Savior, vainly they 
Please be seated. Mark, we're glad you're here today and with two of your children, and we welcome you to the platform. Well, thank you, Greg. We appreciate that very much. And uh, I also enjoyed that song. We always would sing that at our sunrise service that we would have. And the whole community came in. And as uh, Greg just mentioned to us, uh, in years past, a lot of people would come to that. I remember the sunrise service there in Ocean County Memorial Park every year. Hordes of people would drive in. And as the decades went on or years went on, uh, the crowds got thinner and thinner because uh, just not that same emphasis in our society. That's why we need to stand up and be counted for the Lord. And that's why we need to sing and shout. You know, the scriptures tell us in the book of Psalms, let all those who rejoice in thee, let them shout for joy. And Bill McDonald said, why do we have to wait to heaven to shout? We'll shout right now, right? And so that's what we need to be doing. And as Greg was standing up here, I couldn't help but think of his mom and his dad, too. Uh, they came to our Bible studies down there at Crestwood Manor. That study is still going on 24 years later. And um, if you were to go to our website, knowtheword.com, and you look at the Bible study splash page, I guess is what you call it, you'll see your mom front and center right in that Bible study. Great memories of uh, having all those people a part of our study and still have them a part of our study as well. Well, I've been asked to speak on a passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, so please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And while you're turning, I'll mention to you that uh, we just enjoyed a men's conference yesterday, and this week coming up, Lord willing, uh, from Monday through Thursday, we'll be having a conference at America's Keswick. We call it the Feeding the Flock Conference. Again, you can find information about that conference on our website, knowtheword.com, not .org, but knowtheword.com, and uh, all the details, including the schedule. And uh, if you have the opportunity, you're most welcome to come on down. It's not that far away. It's just down the parkway. Make a right at exit 80, and you're there in a couple minutes. And uh, we have a great schedule planned uh, for the week. And uh, if you'd like to come and take the meetings in and even take a lunch, just let us know ahead of time, and uh, you'll be our guest for that lunch. So who's going to take me up on that offer? How can you get away from a free lunch? And no strings attached. And we won't send you a bill in the mail afterwards. So uh, we hope that you can join us if you can. And if you can't, for some reason, you can't do that. Uh, we are online, and we stream those services online. We have a couple of speakers. We have Warren Henderson from Montana. He'll be in there in person. George Ferrier from Canada. He'll be there in person. We have Bruce Holsheiser from Pennsylvania, and then we have Gary McBride. He'll be on Zoom. And then we have Paul Bramson and Chris Schroeder and Leighton Kerr as our report speakers as well. So we have 13 or 14 different messages all the way from Monday through Thursday lunch. So we'd love to have you join us for that uh, conference, Feeding the Flock 2024. So 1 Peter chapter 3 and picking up at verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. 
For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And God will certainly bless the reading and obedience to his word. Now, Lord willing, uh, the speaker who was here last week, whoever he was, probably took up the first portion of this chapter. Uh, I trust that's the case. Maybe you weren't here. Maybe he had because he's allowed to speak on any other portion if the Lord so leads him. But in this chapter here, we have godly living in the light of our family situation. That's found in verses 1 through 7. Godly living in front of one another, fellow believers in Christ. Those are the verses that I just read, verses 8 through 13. And then finally, uh, rather, verses 8 through 12. And then verses 13 through 17, godly living in the world around us. So you have three different categories. Godly living in front of our family members. Godly living in front of fellow believers. And godly living in front of our foes. That's the world around us people who are opposed to the gospel. And so certainly there's a call for each one of us to exercise godly living because the Lord said earlier in 1 Peter chapter 1, be ye holy for I am holy. Some may say, well, how can I do that? God is holy. How can I live a holy life? I mean, with all the distractions around us and with what I know that's within me, that desire, as Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. How can I live a holy life and be pleasing to the Lord? Well, guess what? God says you can, and you can if you want to. If you have that desire, the Holy Spirit lives inside every single believer. It can help a believer live for Christ. I remember the account of an Irishman who had a bad temper. You know, for some reason, we like to slot different ethnicities and say, well, they have problems, okay? So Irish people have a problem with their temper. Germans are stubborn, you know, and you you go right down the line with all these things. Well, that's nice, and we can laugh, and we can identify with that. But really, like someone said, God can make an Irishman act like a Christian, And God can make an Italian act like a Christian and so forth and so on. And God gives us that ability because it says in Philippians chapter 2, he works in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. The question is, are we committed to him? Are we truly committed to him? And have we uh, realized that it's a step-by-step experience? Just think of Moses. Here he was, 80 years of age or I should say 40 years of age, before he was going to lead the children of Israel all the way to age 80 through the wilderness. And so, uh, let me get my facts right here. He was 40 years old, then he had another segment of 40 years, and then 40 years in the wilderness. And so Moses was uh, going to be called of the Lord. And what did the Lord do? He brought him out to an area. There was a bush that was burning but wasn't consumed. That's a little picture of the nation of Israel always being Uh, under the fires of affliction, but never consumed. That's the picture that we have with that tree. But Moses there was receiving his call from the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, what's that in your hand? And it was his staff. This staff was how he made his living. God told him to throw that staff down on the ground. What happened when it was thrown down on the ground? It became a serpent. You know, anything that we put our hand to has, uh, can be used for wrong purposes. And so Moses was told, this is what's still there. It still has that capability in your own heart and in your hands to do things that are not honoring and glorifying to the Lord. But then he picked it up. He was instructed by God to pick that up. And he picked that up, and it immediately became the staff again, that rod. 
And that rod used in that way for consecrated purposes was that same rod that stood before the Red Sea and divided the Red Sea. That was used of the Lord in tremendous ways. That rod of God, it was called after that point. It was consecrated to the Lord because it was consecrated in a consecrated hand. And so when a person says, Lord, use me, I want to be used for your purposes and for your uh, plan in my life, God can consecrate you and make you a chosen vessel in his eyes and in his service. And so we don't have to say, well, the distractions are out there, the temptations are out there, the problems are out there. How can I measure up? He says, be holy, I'm holy. And what he will do, he will accomplish. And if you ever received any correspondence from me, you'll see under my name, I have that verse from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ. God doesn't give his gifts in vain. If he's called you to his, himself, he will accomplish that which he pleases in you. So keep that promise ever before you. Just like Jacob. Jacob was there at Bethel, Genesis chapter 28. You can look up the verse. It's verse 15. And God spoke to Jacob there at that scene where he had his dynamic encounter with the Lord. Uh, Jacob went to sleep. There was a ladder that came out, it says, from heaven. It was set up on earth, so it was initiated from heaven, came down on earth. And the angels of God were ascending and descending upon that ladder. And the voice of the Lord says, I will surely bring you back to this land. What I promised, I will do. And, of course, God was speaking in that context of a physical land and certain promises to the person of Jacob. But we can take those verses and you can run over to the New Testament and you can find their equivalent in the Christian life, how God will bring you through if you trust him, if you put your full weight upon him. If you ask him to lead you and guide you, he will do that. And you can find just the exact same New Testament verse that applies to the Christian just as it applied to Jacob there in the Old Testament. And he will indeed bless. Of course, you know the rest of the story, right, in Genesis 28. Jacob said, well, if you do this, and if you keep me in my way, and if you provide for me, and you do everything, this is Jacob speaking, right, then I will give you a tenth on every dollar, you know, like a dime on every dollar, in essence, what he said. How nice of Jacob to bless the almighty God with the promise that he would give him uh, a tenth on every dollar, you know, but that's Jacob. Jacob was in his infancy in terms of his spiritual walk with the Lord, but at least he said the right thing. He said, Lord, I acknowledge the fact that you have a right in my life. And so God has a right in your life. And if you've said yes to Christ, he wants you to walk in high places. He doesn't want low living. He wants you to be like it says, the, the deer that can get on that rock face and he can be in a, uh, what could be a precarious situation and be sure footed. And we sure do need to have sure footedness in the day in which we live. And so we are encouraged to live godly lives. And so there's no excuse not to live a godly life. And so here in 1 Peter chapter 3, we have that exhortation to live godly in our homes. That's verses 1 through 7. And the portion I've been asked to speak on, godly in front of one another. And then, of course, godly in the midst of this world. So let's look at some of these details that we have here in 1 Peter chapter 3. So it says in verse 8, finally, here Peter is drawing a conclusion to this thought. It wasn't the conclusion of the epistle right yet. But he says, finally, all of you be of one mind, have compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Now, you can't say it any plainer than that, can you? And yet believers can fall into the same pattern that the world falls into. They can be uh, occupied with their own friends. That's what the world and we can call also cliques. We can be unkind to others, especially if they've been unkind to us. So we feel, okay, you've been unkind to me. I'll be unkind to you. I don't get back. I get even. 
And that language can be the language of believers. And yet we're told and we're exhorted in Scripture to walk higher than that. We have a higher standard. We are to follow the steps of our Lord Jesus. Now, someone rightly pointed out that in 1 Peter chapter 2, the chapter before, it doesn't say walk in his steps. That's impossible. He's the son of God. He was perfect without any sin. And yet we're to follow his steps. That means we walk in the path that he walks. He walked in a path, path of humility and meekness. Matthew chapter 11 tells us the Lord Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. Part of the problem is uh, we might be disturbed in our thinking and our spirits and all that because we're not walking in the ways of the Lord. We might have some grudge that we've been holding for a year, two years, 20 years. I've heard people who've held grudge for 40 years. And they can't seem to get past it because they want to really get back at somebody for what they did. And we're not talking the guy across the street or their neighbor. We're talking about a fellow believer. That's what the context here is of this chapter. Fellow believers not getting along. And so the Lord here is speaking through the pen of Peter. And he says, finally, be of one mind. Philippians chapter 1 has that same thing. We strive together for the faith of the gospel for the sake of the Lord. You know, when I was a Christian, uh, age 18, 19 years of age, in our youth group, we would sing, they shall know we are Christians by our love, by our love. You know, we would sing that song. I don't hear that song that much these days, but, you know, um, and you don't want to hear it all the way through, my solo. <laughs> but we would sing that all the time, and that's what it meant, was that we really need to be on the same page. And so Peter here is saying that we should strive together. We should be of one mind and have compassion for one another. There's diversity in the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's when you, when you see an issue come up or a problem that may come up or whatever, there is such diversity in the body of Christ that people look at it from different angles. That's why the Gospels are presented to us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are all gospel writers, but they give different perspectives of the life of Christ. And so Matthew's going to look at it from a Jewish standpoint. Mark's going to look at it from a Roman standpoint. Luke's going to look at it from a uh, Greek standpoint, from a humanity uh, standpoint. And then John, of course, has got the divine picture. In Ezekiel chapter 1, when Ezekiel receives a vision, he sees a vision, and he has this vision of God uh, and we see uh, that represented by uh, a man, by an eagle, and by a man, and by an ox, and by an eagle. And those four things in Ezekiel chapter 1 correspond to the gospel accounts. There is uh, Matthew. I said, I, I forget how I said it, but it's a lion, actually. And so lion is depicting a king of beasts, right? And so in Matthew's account, we have Christ as the king uh, and all the references that Matthew brings out from the Old Testament highlighting the fact that he is indeed the king of the Jews, Matthew chapter 2. And then Mark, he's a servant, and that's depicted by that ox in Ezekiel chapter 1, a vision that Ezekiel saw, the ox, the burden bearer. That's the picture of Mark. And then the face of a man, it says in Ezekiel chapter 1. That's the compassionate Christ, different angle there of the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, the eagle, the high-flying eagle with all the perspective from above. That's the picture of John's gospel. And the point of the matter is that all these four gospels give us a different view and different perspective of Christ. And to go one step further, the body of Christ has different views and different perspectives. So where there's an issue that comes out, a lot of people have different approaches to it. And if your approach doesn't agree with my approach, it's not for me to go back to you and say, you don't know what you're talking about. Because God may be using you in a special way because of your angle and background and everything else and knowledge of the word and all those things. So therefore, when we, it says here, have compassion for one another, be of same mind, we have the same attitude, but we have different perspectives. And just because your perspective is not the same as my perspective, it doesn't give me the right to criticize you or attack you. Things have to be done with the right heart and the right mind. And so therefore, Peter is saying, have compassion for one another, love as brothers, tender-hearted, 
and courteous. Boy, I love some of these plain languages, right? My feeling is when somebody comes in, like we did today, we came walking in, I haven't been here for a little bit, and to be greeted, hi, how are you? Smile and a face, that's great. And you know, I can't help but stress this in, in our own assembly. Visitors come in, don't look at it as somebody else will take care of it. Maybe the Lord is using you in a special way or can use you in a special way to say that same thing and be a blessing to others. You know, I've learned in my own Christian life, you reach out and take that step and you'll be blessed in your heart. The gospel says a person who is going to gain their life, give their life away, and you'll gain it. There's so much to be had by serving the Lord and giving of yourself. But if you're waiting there for the invitation, you know, from someone else to come to you, and you're just waiting on people to come to you, uh, that's like it says in the scripture, the one who just holds on to his life will lose that. We're not talking physically. We're just talking about the enjoyment, the fulfillment of the Christian life. And so Peter here is really exhorting us very clearly, be proactive as a believer and reach out and be compassionate and have love for one another. And that's what Peter is bringing out here. It's all part of that exhortation to be holy just as he is holy. That's the positive side, verse 8. The negative side is verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. On the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Well, what were the steps of the Lord Jesus? Just look at the previous chapter, chapter 2. Here it is, verse 21. This is chapter 2 of First Peter. And verse 21, for to this you were called. This is the calling for the believer. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, he wasn't lying, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who bore himself, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes, Christ's stripes, his lashings, you were healed. So there it is very clearly laid out before us. The Lord Jesus, when he was reviled, when he was threatened, uh, when all these things occurred to him, he didn't lash out and look for revenge. He didn't look to get back. And uh, all of us fall in this category. This is the way we are in our nature. We all have a sin nature. That sin nature doesn't disappear. It won't disappear until you go to glory. So the natural reaction for the person, any person, is to get back, to seek revenge, to uh, I'll show you type of attitude. Everybody has it. The difference is the world says, that's what I'm going to do, and I don't have any regret about it the christian does it and feels guilty if they're a true believer and yet we still can do it so the idea is rise above that one of the very first messages i ever gave series of messages was at iroquina as a young uh, believer and in the lord's work for the full, full first time in 93 as it was announced it was a series series called rising above and the idea is to rise above the standard that the world sets. And so Christ has raised a standard for us, and he's given a much higher standard. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean the temptation is not there. But it means that you now, because you are a Christian, you have the capability, you have the, the, uh, the resources within you, the Holy Spirit, and the one who wants to help you to rise above that situation. God has given you that ability. So you don't have to say, I can't do it, because the Holy Spirit tells us in his word, God's word, that we can. And so we are not to strike back, to show vengeance. Romans chapter 12 says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'll take care of that situation. Ours is to wait on the Lord and take care of that situation. 
Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a great preacher from a previous generation, some of you remember him, perhaps personally, I don't know, but I heard his tapes when I was a new believer. He died, I think, back in 1960 or something like that. But his messages you can still find on the Internet, tremendous Bible teacher. He said he went to a, um, and I, I might have told this story here. I've told this story all over the place. But, uh, you know, he went to a, let's call it a fellowship that was more demonstrable in their worship. Let's call it that, okay? And he took as his text that day three verses. Exodus 14, 13. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, mind you, the audience he's speaking to, right? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's Moses with the rod of God in his hand, standing there in front of the Red Sea. And God says to him, you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And by standing still, not involved in his own work to try to create a situation or resolve a situation. Now, mind you, the Egyptians are in fast pursuit behind him. And he's standing before uh, the deep blue sea. Maybe that's where that phrase comes from, being the devil and the deep blue sea. He's standing there before the Red Sea. And he is holding that rod of God in his hand. And God says, don't do a thing. And you know what happened? The Red Sea parted, right? God did a miraculous thing and opened that Red Sea up. Maybe there's a Red Sea experience that stands before you and blocks the path for something that you know it would work out. Well, you know, you wait on the Lord. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Experience after experience in our life, whether it's work or whether it's home or whatever it might be, you stand still and let the salvation of the Lord be seen. Stand still. Don't try to get your mitts into it because every time we put our hands to it, we ruin it, to be honest. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Maybe that's predicated upon this verse from Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still in worship, in reverence to him. Be still, knowing, connecting with him. You know, when Joshua went out to do battle before Jericho, uh, the, he met with the other Joshua. Joshua means Jesus. Joshua is the Hebrew form of Jesus. And there was another one who was the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord of hosts there, in Joshua chapter 5 at the end of the chapter. And because Joshua, the physical Joshua, commander general Joshua of the Israelites, met with the Joshua of the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, the two connected. And because he connected, he was able to go out into battle with success because he was on the right ground. He was connected to the living God. He didn't do a single thing. He just connected with him. Be still and know that I'm God. And then finally, in Ruth chapter 3, verse 18, it says, sit still and know how the matter will go, knowing that the man will not rest until he finds that, uh, that help that day. That's a picture of Ruth and Abimelech. Abimelech is a perfect picture of Christ if you read through that book. Be still, stand still, sit still. Dr. Barnhouse said at the end of that message, the audience didn't know what to do. <laughs> they, were, they were used to, you know, showing their uh, excitement about things. How do you handle that? Well, that's what we need to do. Always be trusting in the Lord, putting this situation to him, asking him for help. If he wants you to do something, if you need to say something, do something, make something right, he'll give you that guidance, that direction. But pr primarily, it is let the Lord lead us and guide us. And so this is what we are reading about here, not to return evil for evil or uh, all these things, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you're called to a blessing. God is calling you to a higher plane, a higher level, higher ground. We used to always sing that hymn. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Plant your feet on higher ground. When I'm overwhelmed, Psalm 62, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's our position. Taking it to the rock, the Lord Jesus. He's the rock, that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we lead, uh, we ask the Lord to lead us to a higher plane, a higher level. And we don't use the resources of the world and the attitude of the world. It's contrary contrary so that can we can receive a blessing 
so that we have the blessing of the Lord upon us, the sense of his presence, the sense of his power working through us, the words that have force to them, not just cliches, something that has meaning to it and has power behind it because there's experience behind it. When the, children, when the uh, disciples, rather, were in this, on the Sea of Galilee in their boat and they went through that whole experience in Matthew 14, the waves and the wind were knocking against the boat. The Lord Jesus came down and met them. It's a wonderful picture of the intercessory work of Christ. He came to them and they, you know, it was Peter who said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water and walk with you. And so the Lord said, come, calling Peter out of the boat to walk in a supernatural way that he'd never walked before. Peter did that, first time experience, all of a sudden looks down at the water and starts to sink, you know the story, but the Lord caught him. You know, Peter would later write here in this same epistle, 1 Peter chapter one, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And that's the Lord Jesus doing that, he can give us the help. So after the Lord caught Peter and he rose Above those circumstances, you can rise above the circumstances. He got back in a boat. The boat got to shore. And when it was all finished, the disciples said, now we know that you are the son of God. Well, they knew that before mentally. But now they could speak with conviction in their heart. We know you are the son of God. And that's one of the values of going through the spiritual valleys and the trials of life when we come through that our faith might appear uh, to him with praise and glory, as it says in that first chapter. And so we are called to inherit a blessing, leave this place today, walking out those doors and saying, I am called to inherit a blessing, but you have to do it by God's way. And so the Apostle here, Peter, verse 10, then quotes words from Psalm 34. And this is what he says. He who would love life. Do you want to love life? Do you want to love life? If you want to love life, this is what you need to do by God's word. If you want to see good days, let your tongue refrain from evil. You don't speak evil. Let your lips not speak deceit. That's lying. That's guile. Guile is deceit. Guile is making it look like something else when it's not. If you want to love life and see good days, put this on your checklist. I'm not going to speak evil with my tongue. I'm not going to let my lips speak deceit. I'm going to turn away from evil. That's your feet. So you got your tongue, your lips, your feet. There could be the eyes that put it there, making sure you look at the right thing. Uh, let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ear are, ears are open unto the prayers, and the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now that's the work of the Lord in the life of the believer. What is the work of the Lord in the life of the believer? Just like a person, okay, the way God... Describes it. Some theologians call it the anthropomorphic experience here. What, in other words, we don't see God as that way. He's a spirit and he's invisible. But the scripture depicts him so we can identify. He's got eyes that watch us, beholding the evil and the good. And his eyes are on the righteous. Someone said it this way. Not because he's watching to see what you do wrong. Somebody said it a different way. He loves you so much, he can't take his eyes off of you. <laughs> I like that. His eyes are on the righteous, his eyes. His ears are open to your prayer, even if it's uttered in just a sentence. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. His hand is there to guide us and provide for us. His arm is mighty to save. It's got strength. He can change circumstances. All the aspects of the uh, work of the Lord, the person of God, and his voice speaks peace to his people. Mark this down, Psalm 85, verse 8. The Lord speaks peace to his people, but let them not return to folly, to the ways of the world. The voice of the Lord is a still, small voice. Elijah learned that on top of Mount Carmel. 
And so we have to be before him in his presence, silent and understanding what he wants us to do. All the aspects of the work of God. And so we understand that. We have confidence because, as Psalm 34 says, that's where it's from. Peter is quoting from that portion. Well, that's in front of one another. But there are verses here from verses 13 through 17 about our behavior in front of the world. What's it say in verse 13? Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? That's a great promise from God's word, isn't it? Who is he who will harm you if you're followers of him who is good? Someone said it this way, our life work is not finished. Uh, our life is not uh, finished until our life work is done. In other words, we are immortal until our life work is finished. God has his hand upon every single believer. And he's guiding our steps and uh, taking care of us every step of the way. Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, it says, verse 14, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats and trouble. Peter's like taking us aside here in this scripture. And he says, okay, for your righteous testimony in the eyes of this world, there are people out there. There's the mass population for the most part is neutral. They're like, okay, you know, that's, he's a nice person. He's a nice guy. Yeah, he's a nice guy. We see him at the post office every week. You know, we see him at the shop right, the food market. He's a nice guy. Most of the population is pretty, pretty nice about these things. There's a segment of that population who have bought into the world system in a big way, and they hate somebody who's living for the Lord. And that's the type of person that uh, is being referred to here. Even if for righteousness sake you are uh, going to uh, be persecuted, don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Why? Because the uh, Lord is the avenger of all such. He knows what to do. He can take care of it. He's working it out in his plan. He can protect you. He can guide your steps. He can make it so you get a phone call or you get diverted or something like that to get out of a situation, and you may not even know it. This is the mystery of God's sovereignty and his ways to work in the life of people, true believers. And so God here is telling us, this is not Peter. This is not Peter's thoughts. This is from the corridors of heaven through his pen coming to believers that live then and now and speaking to us. That's why it's the living word. And telling you and telling me, don't be afraid of their threats or be troubled by their threats. God can take care of those things. He can take care of you. But instead, verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's where it begins, right here. Remember Moses, throw down that staff and it became a serpent. What else was Moses told to do? Take your hand, put it into your bosom. You brought it back out again, and what was it? It was a leprous hand. That heart is still deceitful, desperately wicked. He's being called to the service of the Lord, and that hand is leprous. Leprosy is always a picture of sin in the scriptures. Even as he's going, so to speak, into full-time service for the Lord in that leprous hand, but he put it back in again. It was made well. He had to be reminded that there was still that sinfulness that's there. We all have that sinfulness there. And so we'd want to retaliate. We want to push back. It's like the guy who says, I, I don't, I, I'm against these abortion clinics, so what are you going to do? You're going to bomb them? What's that proving? That's, that, that, that's, that's rendering evil for evil. Destruction for destruction. That's not right. And so here, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set aside it in your heart. Be committed in your hearts. And to be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks the reason of hope that lies within you. Why would they ask you a reason of hope? Unless you were showing it in your face and in your actions and in your attitudes. This same Psalm 34 where a lot of these verses were quoted also says they looked to him, the Lord, and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. And so that's the Lord teaching us through Peter's word here that uh, we have this hope uh, and we should answer with meekness and with fear, fear for God. Having a good conscience, not one that some Satan can grab a hold of with a guilt handle, but rather a good conscience. And it says 
that they, when they defame you or try to defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. It's better in the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And that's what God wants from us. Channels only blessed master, but with all thy love and power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. That's what God wants for us. And here Peter is laying it out in really plain language. No excuse. Nice and simple. We don't need to have a special interpreter here to explain these things. This is simple language to live like the Lord and glorify him. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for your precious word that does indeed speak to the issues of the heart. Thank you, Father, for each one here. Thank you for your grace in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for the work of Christ, the work of salvation. So easy to understand in so many ways, but yet so hard to do for those who are struggling with self and with ego and everything else. Lord, we pray that uh, if there are any in this audience this morning that have not bowed the heart and the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may do that this morning. For others, Lord, who have, we pray that we would be in line with your precious word so that we indeed will inherit a blessing. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Take us to our homes, we pray, in safety. We ask these things, giving thanks in our wonderful Savior's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.